Hello. Um, first thing uh, is first, I, will, I um, have the great honor of introducing our speaker, Mr. Ray Singalini. Um, he is a native of Geneva, New York, and a professional uh, former boxer, an award-winning concussion awareness activist, and an established keynote speaker. Ray was instrumental in getting the Concussion Management Awareness Act passed into New York state law, for which he was honored with the New York Executive Chamber Award, the Rochester Hickok Award, Hero Award, and the Brain Injury Association of New York State Public Policy Award. Singalini uh, also founded the Second Impact Concussion Awareness Program and tours nationally at high schools, colleges, NFL HS player development pro, uh, pro, uh, camps, medical seminars, and TBI conferences, all free of charge, lecturing about the importance of addressing concussions promptly and properly. The New York State Athletic Trainers Association has endorsed the Second Impact presentations. His life story was featured nationally by ABC News and won a New York Associated Press and New York News Publishers Award. A member of the Rochester New York Boxing Hall of Fame and the Geneva New York Sports Hall of Fame, Singalini's boxing career, which spanned from 1966 to 1974, was layered with many accolades, most notably the Golden Globe Heart Award and the Jerry Flynn Courage Award. Other notable awards include the Camp Good Days Courage Award and the Rotary Club Paul Harris Award. Also, his contributions were instrumental in getting the 1996 Professional Boxing Safety Act passed into federal law. Singalini has been battling Parkinson's syndrome and dementia pugilistica, chronic traumatic encephalo encephalopathy, uh, which is a direct result of untreated concussions he suffered during his boxing career. Singalini has been participating in several CTE research studies at Boston University School of Medicine, where he has donated his brain upon his death. Ray visits children's special needs facilities and lectures sports teams and organizations about being a champion in athletics and in life. Ray's greatest award, however, is knowing that he is resonating and making a difference in the lives of many athletes and survivors of brain injury. Second impact, the Ray Singalini story by uh, Annie Saigo uh, was, number, was the number one book on Amazon's list of new releases for four weeks and is endorsed by the renowned Dr. Robert Cantu. Um, and, uh, uh, and now, uh, Mr. Singalini, feel free to start your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I consider it a great honor to be part of today's conference. Now, every uh, successful boxer knows the importance of having knowledgeable and dedicated staff work their corner. The great Muhammad Ali was guided by legendary trainers, Angelo Dundee and Bundini Brown. And uh, we are so fortunate to have Columbia University work in the corner of traumatic brain injury. Uh, Andy Siegel, a New York City person, personal injury attorney, is one of the most inspirational people I have ever met. Andy is devoted to helping survivors of brain injury and he authored my book, um, Second Impact, the Ray Giangolini story, to serve as a deterrent for anyone who might consider circumventing proper concussion protocol. Well, I will uh, forever be grateful, and I mean this sincerely, be grateful for his support and friendship. Now, my desire to become a boxer began all the way back in 1957. I was six years old, hanging out in my grandparents' Italian restaurant in Geneva, New York. It was a Friday night, and the barroom was packed with patrons to watch the Gillette Friday night fights on the large black and white television above the bar. Middleweight champion Carmen Basilio was fighting and I watched as the crowd roared with every punch Carmen threw. That night made such an impression on me. After the fight, I ran in the basement, 
and filled a laundry bag with linens. I climbed on top of a pickle barrel, hung it up on the steam pipe, and I started using it as a punching bag. Well, my grandmother came down. She asked me what I was doing. I told her, Grandma, I'm Carmen Basilio. And she said, never mind that boxing. You better go to college. I'll get back in the bar room and help your grandfather. I got a little swat on the behind and off I went. Uh, the rest is history. I'm a former professional boxer and member of the Rochester, New York Boxing Hall of Fame and a career that spanned close to a decade. I had never been knocked down. Every fight was a war and I always prided myself with facing top ranked fighters, which included several US and Canadian national champions. My only regret as a boxer is that I didn't defeat my toughest opponent. And that opponent was a concussion. Concussion is an invisible injury. There are no crutches, no swelling, no stitches, or any other visible signs of injury. I fought this invisible opponent throughout my boxing career, not knowing what it was, or that I was in jeopardy of developing the long-term complications that I cope with today. For many years, I've been battling Parkinson's syndrome and dementia pugilistica, a variant of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is the same condition that has affected many retired NFL players. And these progressive disorders are the direct result of not addressing concussions properly during my boxing career. I take full responsibility and blame no one for my condition. I endorse and encourage athletes to play all sports. The attributes and work ethic principles developed through athletics will benefit athletes well beyond their playing days. And the demanding sport of boxing taught me many lessons about character, humility, and work ethic. I experienced the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. I learned the true meaning of heart, courage, and focus, and what it takes to be successful. Heart is measured by your inner desire to keep punching against all odds. Courage is the ability to fight back your fear. And focus is the difference between a contender and a champion. You may possess great potential, but you will never achieve champion status until you master the discipline of focus. And as far as success is concerned, well, one night as I sat in the dressing room, exhausted after a hard fought victory where they had me rated as an underdog. Um, a sports reporter started his interview in the dressing room with a, a rather facetious remark. He said, uh, hey, Ray, you got a little lucky tonight. Oh, I paused for a second and then I replied, yeah, you know, you're right. It seems the harder I train, the luckier I get. And my response drew a little laughter from the other reporters. But in reality, I realized early on in my career that luck has very little to do with success. Success is all about dedication, hard work, and decisions. The decisions you make will determine how you are defined. Getting to the top, will define you as a contender. Staying at the top will define you as a champion. And resiliency and determination define both my success and demise as a boxer. And it is those same attributes that define and drive me today. Concussion is an inherent risk of sports competition and athletes accept that risk. Concussions are hard to prevent. You play clean and you play hard. They're going to happen. But what is preventable is when an athlete who has sustained a concussion sustains a second concussion before symptoms from the first injury 
it properly healed. This is called second impact injury, which carries with it a high risk of permanent brain damage, and in exceptional cases, can be fatal, primarily among adolescents. In my opinion, the concussion that exhibits mild symptoms can potentially be the most deceptive and dangerous. When the symptoms are mild, you are more apt to think it's not that serious, not report it, and try to play through it, which puts you at risk for second impact injury. Early detection and being totally symptom-free before returning to competition eliminates that risk of second impact injury. Numerous concussions increase the risk of developing neurological complications later in life. After your first concussion, you are more, at, uh, you are more vulnerable to sustain a second, and it is easier yet to get a third, and so on. The lifetime number must be monitored, and extreme caution should be used when several concussions occur within a short period of time. Extreme caution should also be used in youth and adolescent sports where the brain is still in the developmental stage. The number of concussions an athlete can sustain before being advised to retire from contact sports remains a very controversial subject. Present studies remain inconclusive and further research is ongoing for a more definitive answer. But physicians handle each case now on an individual basis with consideration given to the athlete's concussion history. Now the symptoms of a concussion uh, are the body's red flags. They're warning you that something is wrong. They can be immediate or delayed in onset by hours or even days after the injury. The most common symptoms are amnesia, headache, nausea, concentration problems, sleep disturbances, and changes in personality and behavior. It is very important to immediately report all symptoms of concussion, no matter how minor they may appear, and to ensure a safe return to play after a concussion. It is imperative that athletes strictly adhere to their school concussion protocol and doctor's instructions. You know, my, uh, my condition could have been avoided if I had known the consequences of ignoring concussion symptoms. And the problem that athletes are hiding concussions at all levels is real. And downplaying the problem only increases the chance that an athlete would decide to roll the dice or to wager far outseed surprise. Now, I started uh, boxing at a very young age of 14. By the age of 16, a junior in high school, I had everything going for me. I was a well-behaved honor student. And as a boxer, I had a projected bright future in the ring. One night during a bout at Memorial Auditorium in Buffalo, New York, I caught a right hook to the back of my head. Um, there was no knockdown, but I was temporarily dazed and my vision became blurred and my hearing was impaired and the, the crowd noise fluctuated from loud to muffled, back to loud again, and I had never experienced this feeling before. I fought through it and won a unanimous decision, but the next day I developed a headache and I felt fatigued. And these symptoms were of a moderate degree, so I passed it off as just being physically run down from that tough bout the night before. And I was scheduled to fight again one week later at the Syracuse, New York War Memorial. So I resumed training, even though I was hampered by persistent headaches and fatigue. 
you know, I should have gotten medical attention, but I, I just didn't think it was that serious. And little did I know this was the beginning of all my troubles. When I entered the ring in Syracuse, I knew something was wrong. During the first round, I felt lethargic. I wasn't as sharp as usual. And sure enough, I got my bell rung for the second time in one week. There was no knockdown, but I was dazed. And between rounds, when I returned to my corner for instruction, I felt nauseated and vomited in the corner water bucket. I was in a fog. So I relied on my boxing instinct to go the distance, but I lost a close decision that night. But the fog lingered and affected me to the point where I struggled during the post-fight interview and at times didn't realize that I had lost. Well, my life changed after that night. From a well-behaved honor student I started missing school, sleeping in class, and failing all my courses. The headaches and fatigue persisted. I had trouble concentrating. And I slept excessively, sometimes 14 hours or better a day. But then I started having behavioral problems and I developed a resentment toward authority figures and I couldn't explain why. And no one had any idea what was causing my sudden change in grades and behavior. But I believe I was suffering from second impact injury, a condition not yet recognized in medical practice. Now, this is how I was fooled into making some bad decisions. At that time, there was little known about concussions or the dangers of not a dressing them properly. The symptoms of the first concussion were mild, which fooled me into thinking oh, it wasn't that serious. I thought the symptoms were only temporary and I didn't want to miss that next opportunity. Adding to the confusion was the false belief that you had to get knocked unconscious to get a concussion and I had never been knocked out or even knocked down. I received um, the Golden Glove Heart Award given to the boxer showing the most outstanding determination and resiliency for the year. But that award gave me the false impression that I was invincible. And during a training session at the gym, I asked a couple of the old time boxers for advice. I said, you know, I've been having these headaches and I feel tired. Right then one of the old timers jumped up and quipped, son, headaches are a part of this game. You have to deal with them. You have all the ability to get to the top. You have to be able to dish it out and take it to in this sport. Now gut it up, if not, this game is not for you. Well, those comments hit me hard. You know, more than anything else, I wanted to be middleweight champion. But don't get me wrong, the old timers were not intentionally giving me bad advice. They just didn't know any better at that time. And the headaches did seem to lose intensity between fights, which led me to believe that headaches were just part of the fight game and would clear up when I retired from boxing. I worked so hard to get to that level and I didn't want to lose my rank. I thought boxing was my whole life. So I was determined to gut it out. Well, instead of seeking professional help for my symptoms, I foolishly resorted to self remedies. I was looking for a little help to mask the symptoms with the chronic fatigue, I took excessive amounts of vitamin B complex and caffeine tablets to give me more energy. I took high doses of aspirin to take the edge off the headaches, especially on fight night. But the high doses of aspirin upset my stomach. 
So I guzzled Pepto-Bismol to remedy those stomach aches. Now I was making a real tangled web for myself. And during a bout at the Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens, midway through the fourth round, I got a cut above my right eye. The high doses of aspirin that I was taking came back to haunt me. It thinned my blood and made the cut bleed more than normal. And I had the best cut man in the business work in my corner. But he just couldn't stop the wound from bleeding, which prompted the referee to stop the fight before the beginning of the fifth round with me well ahead on points. I beat myself that night, but I continued to self-medicate, still believing the headaches were part of the game. Now, some athletes have to be protected from themselves. My relentless determination and desire defied common sense and logic. In 1971, the New York State Boxing Commission withheld my license to box in the state of New York because of abnormal results from a mandatory electrocephalogram brainwave test. The reapplication process required a one-year layoff and a repeat electrocephalogram and a review hearing before the New York State Boxing Commission's Medical Advisory Board. After confiding with veteran, veteran boxers, I learned that this uh, could be a long procedure with no guarantees, as New York, New York was notorious for having the toughest regulations in the country. Unlike the National Football League, professional boxing was not governed by one national commission. Boxing was in, depend, independently su supervised by each state lacking comprehensive regulations and the technology to access and enforce out-of-state suspensions. I therefore left New York using different aliases to fight in states that had less regulation or no regulation at all. In 1973, I returned to New York for a repeat of electrocephalogram which again produced abnormal results, nullifying my reapplication for a New York State boxing license. You know, I, I defiantly circumvented a New York policy that was put into place to protect me. And looking back now, a federal law or a national boxing commission would have protected me for myself. I continued to fight in unregulated states, but the persistent headaches and fog were wearing me down, both mentally and physically. In 1974, I took a break from boxing, expecting that my symptoms would go away with rest, uh, but the symptoms didn't go away. I then realized I wasn't going to be the middleweight champion. I reluctantly hung up the gloves and threw out all of my memorabilia. Everything that I worked so hard for, I, I just threw it all out. And shortly thereafter, because of sedentary and cognitive issues, I took the advice of a physician friend and voluntarily admitted myself for evaluation at the Clifton Springs Mental Health Clinic. I remained 10 days at the clinic before leaving against medical advice, or I was diagnosed with severe depression. I was living in denial and I didn't want to accept that answer. I refused to take prescribed medication or get suggested counseling. I went into seclusion, traveling the country and hiking the national parks where I took refuge. After several months, the expression, you can run, but you can't hide, became a reality. And I came out battling, because that's what I do. My, my attitude has always been never give up. 
And I relied on my relentless attitude to get me through the toughest of rounds. Now I was relying on that same attitude, the answer to the bell for the toughest fight of my life. And attitude is a matter of choice. And Charles Swindoll said it best. Life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we deal with it. Well, I began pursuing another aspiration. I enrolled in college to become a physical education teacher, but I failed my first semester because of concentration problems. I then landed a job at Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester, New York. I seemed to be holding my own, but a few years later, I developed hand tremors and the forgetfulness worsened. In 1994, the University of Rochester Neuroscience Research Center diagnosed me with dementia pugilistica and Parkinson's syndrome, the direct result of untreated concussions. I repeat, untreated concussions. I was then forced to retire at the very young age of 44. And you know, the only, the only gain that I could make from this lifetime of pain was to do everything I could to prevent another unknowing athlete from going down the same path of destruction. I then devoted my life to concussion education and research. I knew all too well the mindset of determined athletes and the key was concussion education. I contacted the NFL and NCAA expressing my concerns about athletes receiving mandatory concussion education only to be told that we have everything under control. Well, I promptly established the Second Impact Concussion Education nonprofit organization, which consisted of a concussion information website and free speaking engagements at high schools, colleges, medical institutions, and traumatic brain injury conferences from coast to coast. I'm very grateful that my input was instrumental in getting passed into New York state law, the 2010 Concussion Management Awareness Act. This law requires that all school personnel and coaches complete a state approved concussion course biannually and prohibits any athlete that has suffered a concussion from participating in athletic activities until they are symptom free for 24 hours and authorized to return by a licensed physician. My input was also a contributing factor that enabled Congress to pass into law the 1996 Professional Boxing Safety Act, putting an end to the dangerous underhand, underhanded practice of state hopping. This law prohibits boxers from fighting anywhere in the United States while under suspension. And CTE and sports concussion research have made great strides in the last decade. I just recently concluded a five-year CTE legend study at Boston University. The study focused on examining the effects of repetitive head impacts on former athletes and consisted of an annual cognitive testing to gauge the progress and progression of brain function. DNA samples were also taken for genetic analysis. And upon my death, I have donated my brain for continued CTE research at the Concussion Legacy Foundation, Boston University. Well, the most important message that I want athletes and even non-athletes to take away from my presentation is honesty. You know, some athletes pose hiding a concussion as a badge of honor or courage. 
I'm still paying the price for gotten out of concussion. And I can tell you what I did was neither an honorable or a courageous, courageous act. It was a self-destructive act. When it comes to preventing the long-term ill effects of head trauma, athletes must learn to advocate for themselves. Immediate honesty about any concussion symptoms will always be the best policy and protection. And concussion management is not only about a safe return to athletics, students must also be honest about any symptoms that may be affecting them academically. And many schools are implementing, implementing a return to the classroom after a concussion program. And the purpose of this program is to aid a concussed student who may need a gradual transition back to academics. And uh, you can see how important that would have been for me. I highly recommend the services of a certified athletic trainer. They are an essential asset to a sports program where prompt evaluation and proper supervision is crucial. I've had 50 years to ponder what went wrong, and I always come back to the same conclusion. Lack of concussion education and peer pressure led to my demise. Again, concussion is an invisible injury, which can cause a concussed athlete to be vulnerable for negative remarks and peer pressure. This pressure can push an athlete into returning to competition before they've properly healed. In my case, the persistent concussion symptoms were affecting my reflexes and equilibrium, and the headaches would intensify with, exer with exertion. So to compensate, I was holding back on my opponents and doing just enough to win. I was winning, but not winning in convincing fashion like before. And as a result of my change in aggressiveness, I had to counterpunch hurtful remarks as some question if I had lost the eye of the tiger. And some even had the audacity to question if my heart was still in the game. The same boxer that won the Golden Glove Heart Award was now having his heart question. Those negative remarks fueled my bad decision to gut it out. Never underestimate the powerful influence of peer pressure. I always tell athletes, the game you set out today could be the career you save tomorrow. I threw a whole career away for the sake of not missing one fight. What a foolish mistake. I challenged a concussion and I got beat. It cost me my quality of life and my future potential. Never take for granted the privilege of playing the sport you love. Be dedicated, take care of your body, and make wise decisions. This will enable you to reach your full potential. Now, after all of this, for any athlete that still thinks they may want to risk their future, by competing with an existing concussion like I did. This is what it's like for me living with a per permanent brain injury. My life now consists of not what I wanna do, but what I'm capable of doing. I'm very restricted. I've had a headache every day since I was 16. I'm now 70. For many years, I slept excessively, but now I struggle to get three hours of sleep a night. The tremors. I used to be so ashamed of my hands trembling that when we went out in public, I would sit on my hands to hide them from shaking. But I don't hide anything anymore. And the dementia. 
I'm constantly in a fog and I battle it every day. I have good days and bad days. On good days like today, I can function fairly well for short periods of time. Medication adjustments with the consent of my doctor enable me to be more audible during this period. But on bad days, I struggle to tie my shoes or I forget the names of lifelong friends. On bad days, I'm restricted to the house where I not only miss family and friends functions, but so does my wife, Patty, or she must attend alone. My family sacrifices so much on my behalf and I struggle with that guilt. But one of the hardest conditions for me to accept was having my driving and hiking privileges restricted for my own well-being and the well-being of others. But what really hit me the hardest was being restricted from taking my granddaughters for walks unsupervised because of memory lapses. And this is the grim reality of more restrictions to come. But with that being said, I have never been knocked down in my entire career. And I refuse to allow dementia to be the front first one to do that. Now, if I had it all to do all over again, I would still pursue a boxing career, absolutely. I would still compete with the same tenacity and dedication that it takes to be a champion. The only thing that I would do differently is that I would immediately get medical attention for any symptoms of injury that my body was warning me to address. With the education that we have today about concussions, the word is out and the help is there. Make the smart choice. In closing, always remember, I wouldn't be talking to you today if I had addressed my first concussion properly. Thank you. Can't hear. Thank you so much for such an inspirational and insightful presentation. I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, now for any questions, you, you, uh, anyone that has a question could raise their hand, uh, Mr. Kelly. Good afternoon, Hi. Um, Ray, thank you so much. Um, I have been fortunate to have heard dozens and dozens of Ray's speeches and I am moved and I am affected and I am touched every time I hear him speak and I learn something new every day. Ray, my question is, and um, having been in professional athletics for 40 plus years as well and knowing you for most of that time, you mentioned how the athletes with peer pressure and you're right, you're 100% right. What about the coaches and the athletic directors that, that I work for now having been a professional coach we know the rules, but sometimes we're pressured by our athletic directors to make sure this kid is ready to play. Those are the words we hear. My, my question to you is how do we, as coaches, you know, by, bypass that and, and go against our AD? Because these kids, they're kids, 17, 18 year old, they're kids. If I say play, they'll play. They, they could have a limb hanging from their arm and they're going to play. If the coach says play. My question to you, Ray, what advice do you have to touch the athletic directors, my bosses, so I can follow the, follow the proper protocol? And again, Ray, thank you so much. And you say your, your quality of life has changed. Ray, I can speak on behalf of the thousands of people that you've resonated over over the course of years. Your quality of life means the world to them, my friend. It means the world to them. You're a hell of a man, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I believe that the key to everything is education. Uh, I don't believe there's a bad intended coach out there, but sometimes winning uh, can override everything. But with education, 
that's the first step. And the second step would be for the athletic trainer or whomever, the coach, to stand up with integrity and uh, be a little bit adamant about protecting that athlete. And I, I, I believe that that should suffice. I, my experience, most uh, ADs and coaches are great people. And seldom do you find uh, one that's a little bit um, what you would call the tough guy syndrome. And um, that's something we're overcoming little by little with education. I hope I've answered that for you. Yes, you certainly have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a great question. If anyone else has a question, feel free to post it in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom or on the camera um, so, uh, to pose your question. Okay, so there is um, one question. Um, have you seen any obstacles from big industry um, or uh, large uh, corporations in uh, raising awareness for uh, concussions and concussion treatments um, while on the path, like um, either for uh, money reasons it's, uh, or um, uh, like as someone mentioned before, trying to keep players in the game? Well, I do bump into that continually. And I'm always asked to endorse a product. But I'm very careful about that. And I mean, the, it went as far as um, some individuals had what they had was pills that um, cured concussions or prevented concussions. And uh, it's just, it's kind of disheartening to see that because we all know that that's not going to work or the, the helmet that comes out that is going to prevent concussions. Helmets do not prevent concussions. The helmet is there to protect against lacerations. But yeah, um, there are some parents and children that will believe that they can just use it as a battering ram because they can't get a concussion. So yes, I do bump into that a lot. And uh, I seldom endorse a product, seldom without really doing some research. I leave the research up to uh, Dr. Cantu and Dr. Bazarian, and uh, they're doing a phenomenal job with that. So, better leave it to them. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. There is one question in the chat from Neil. Um, he asks, is there any advice you would give to TBI sufferers to cope with chronic headaches and foggy headness? Headedness. Okay. Um, they're TBI individuals. So, well, the first thing that is, uh, is to pay strict attention to your doctor's instructions. That is uh, the number one rule. And with that, I mean, sometimes we feel as though when we start to get better, take like medication. Uh, sometimes we feel like we don't need the medication anymore, uh, things of that nature. We have to stay on track with what our doctor's telling us for number one. And the old rule of thumb is that whatever aggravates you or aggravates the headache or injury, cut back on it. I uh, just stick with it. And I think with the technology that's coming out and will come out, uh, things are only going to get better. So try to remain positive and be a good role model. 
Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, and I believe that is the scheduled time for uh, the session. If no one has any questions, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ray uh, Cingolini for speaking and sharing um, a, a very inspirational journey and um, in, in terms of, uh, and a very noble one in terms of the goals uh, uh, you have set for yourself after your career as well. And I want to thank everyone else for joining us. Um, I hope we all walk away um, with with the advices that uh, Mr. Rachel Galini has um, given us. And and with that, I, I'd like to conclude the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. It's always fantastic, Ray. <laughs>